Bill Crystal's already had a varied and exciting career. You all know of his role on Fox, especially the Sunday morning program. You also know he's the editor of the Weekly Standard. You may not know he played the single most important role in killing off the Clinton health care plan with his very insightful faxes picking that plan apart. Tonight, he's coming back to his earlier roots since he taught political philosophy at Penn and at the Kennedy School in the 80s. I would also add that at that time he spoke at the University of Chicago to what was only the second annual Federal Society Student Symposium. So he goes back a long way with the organization. He has a PhD as well as a BA from Harvard. I, I left out that he's written, uh, in the past he's written columns for both Time Magazine and, New, and the New York Times, regular columns. Rumor has it that the New York Times dropped his column after he told John Stewart that he'd been re that he, that is John Stewart, had been reading the New York Times too much. <laughs> I, I have known Bill since we were teenagers, and his ideas, as you probably know from Fox and the Weekly Standard, are always fascinating. We're truly honored to have him as our banquet speaker tonight. Bill? Well, thanks, Gene. Uh, only at the Federal Society would it be considered a, a subject for rollicking merriment that the earth might be destroyed tomorrow. <laughs> I could imagine I could imagine the Federalist Society symposium on the earth's being destroyed, you know. <laughs> Originalism and the destruction of the earth. <laughs> I, I, I've, uh, I promised Lee Otis that I would mention the word originalism once up here in my in my remarks, and now I've done my job, so I don't have to. Um, I will not. I will not tell you about originalism since I know much less about it than everyone who's been uh, speaking and discussing and debating it today. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be uh, with the Federal Society. I was involved a little bit at the beginning and have been in various symposia. I always like to say the Federalist, one of the things I admire the most about the Federal Society is that it does provide an occasion for debate and uh, discussion and differences of views. Uh, the views usually at a Federal Society symposium run the gamut from A to B, uh, from, <laughs> from, you know, from Scalia to Bork, you know, there's a lot of... <laughs> It's not true, actually. One of the admirable things about the Federal Society, and this was a principle that Gene and, and Lee and Dave and Steve and the other founders laid down at the beginning, was to try to have many debates and to try to have points of view represented that uh, the people uh, mostly involved in the society didn't necessarily agree with, because that would sharpen uh, people's minds. And and uh, and I think that's really been the case, and I gather it's been the case uh, at this symposium as well. I wish there were more. I mean, it is literally true. I always think that there's more diversity at the Federal Society symposia than there are in most. Uh, academic political science departments, or I imagine uh, law schools, and which is ironic since presumably the law school or the political science department is supposed to be the place with diverse views, and the federal society, in a sense, is entitled to sort of uh, represent more one, one side of the argument. But in fact, it's a tribute to the federal society that it doesn't. I want to congratulate Professor Henderson for, I'm sure, what is a, a well-deserved award. And I like very much in the introduction that you were given credit for being uh, willing to weigh in on issues about which which you knew nothing. Um, is, that, is that what you said? Is that, yeah, you could be very good panelists on Fox News. <laughs> um. oh, don't repeat, don't repeat that, please. Don't. Um. I've enjoyed catching up on Penn. I taught here for my first, my first job out of out of what I got my degree from Harvard, and I've enjoyed discussing with Dean Fitz how far Penn has come since I left, and it has actually come up in the world quite a lot. I left Penn to go to Harvard actually in '83 to the Kennedy School of Government. Uh, I was the token conservative on the faculty at the Kennedy School. They like to have one at all times. <laughs> it's useful for the students to know what one looks like, you know. <laughs> especially when they get out and have to have a job interview. <laughs> they, um, I, I was chatting about Harvard with a couple of 
people from Harvard out uh, in the reception and uh, the amazing fact that Scott Brown won the election in Massachusetts um, this last month. And he reminded me when I was up at Harvard uh, from 83 to 85 and 84, of course, we lived outside uh, Cambridge and Belmont, right near Cambridge. It was the eighth congressional district of Massachusetts. Tip O'Neill was our congressman. He was the Speaker of the House, revered figure up in Boston, totally Democratic congressional district. It had been John Kennedy's district 30 years before. And I remember voting in November 84, and I voted for um, President Reagan for re-election. He actually carried Massachusetts and every other state in the Union except Minnesota that year. Uh, and I remember, and I voted for the Republican, actually a man named Ray Shamey, who was running against John Kerry in Kerry's first U.S. Senate race. I'll interrupt the story to say that I, I, I saw Senator Kerry about three years ago. He was doing Fox News Sunday. We were chatting in the green room, and he vaguely remembered I had some Harvard, Massachusetts kind of connection. They asked when I'd been there, and I said I'd uh, taught there from 83 to 85, and I said, you know, laughing, that I voted against you in your first Senate race, Senator Kerry. And maybe you're not aware of this, but John Kerry doesn't have a great sense of humor. You know, so, um, so he drew himself up and looked down at me and said, Bill, uh, you know, you, you voted against me? And I, I said, yeah, sure. I mean, he won by you know, 15 points or something. It didn't matter. And I uh, said, Bill, my opponent was not really well qualified for the job. So, <laughs> I think, gee, lighten up, Senator Kerry. You know, so, um, Anyway, I voted against Kerry, and as a loyal Reagan Republican by this point, I, I voted for the opponent uh, running against Tip O'Neill, even though I knew it was hopeless. And I remember the next morning, this was pre-internet and all that, so uh, we knew, of course, Reagan had won, we knew Kerry had won, and I remember asking Susan, my wife, uh, who had the Boston Globe at, at breakfast, I just out of curiosity, how many votes the Republican running against Tip O'Neill had gotten? And Susan looked at the election tables and sort of looked again and said, I hate to tell you this, there was no Republican running against Tip O'Neill. <laughs> and I said, you know, I know I voted for someone against Tip. <laughs> It turned out I had voted for the communist. <laughs> it's a true story. Um, I went actually a couple, a few months, a couple months later. Bill Bennett became Secretary of Education uh, for Prime President Reagan. I knew him slightly. He called me up, asked me to come to Washington to work for him for a year. And as those of you who've been in uh, Washington and in, in political appointments and administrations know, you know, when you get a job offer like that, you have to be cleared by the White House. They want to make sure that you know you're a loyal supporter of the president, and plus you don't have any terrible scandals and all that, and that you're not, um, you know, just some crony of the cabinet secretary or something. And and so I remember going for my job, the interview at the White House with a woman named Becky Norton Dunlop, whom some of you will probably remember if you were around in the Reagan days, who was a very nice woman, but a kind of tough, she was the enforcer in presidential personnel, who kept all the squishy non-Reagan Republicans out and insisted that, you know, which was good, and you know, insisted the departments were full of loyal and hopefully competent as well, Reaganites. And I remember going for my interview and I was very nervous, and I said, you know, I'd been for Reagan in 80 and 84 and had debated on his, for him at the Kennedy School and all these places that were, it wasn't that popular. And I was a loyal Republican down the line and had voted against Kerry. And I said, laughing, I even tried to vote against Tip O'Neill, but unfortunately, I voted for the communist. And Becky looked at me stone-facedly and said, Bill, here in the Reagan White House, voting for a communist is no laughing matter. <laughs> which I admired. It's probably why we, why we had a good White House and the Reagan White House. And they held, up my, they held up my job for about two months until, you know, Bennett personally called, I don't know, the chief of staff or something and got me, got me through. Anyway, and I've, over the years, and we then moved to Washington. We've been there ever since, but uh, and I've not been uh, that much involved, obviously, in campuses and, and therefore not so much involved with law schools. Not that I was that much involved before. I was a political scientist, but um, I, I've tried to uh, do occasional federal society events and speeches and meet with people from the Federal Society. It's always been great, great pleasure. It's really one of the great, honestly, success stories of the modern, not just of the modern conservative movement, though that too, uh, but of the modern academy, I would say, and of uh, the modern intellectual, you know, uh, sort of uh, affairs in the United States over the last 30 years. This organization that was started from nothing by a few students less than 30 years ago uh, has been, as we can see here tonight, but uh, certainly over the years, um, 
you know, not just a place for people to get together, but a place of intellectual excitement and of real change, of causing and helping to cause a real intellectual change in the academy and in the courts uh, and in our country. So it's a very, uh, it's a very rare achievement. You know, I've been involved in helping to found lots of organizations. Luckily, and Professor Henderson sort of alluded to this, you forget about the ones that you helped found that disappeared after three or five or seven years, and you remember the one or two that have really succeeded, and the Federal Society is is one of those.